and welcome to Autism in Conversation with Auticon, a new podcast from Auticon, a global IT consultancy whose consultants are all autistic. This brand new series is designed to help raise awareness of what it means to be autistic through fascinating conversations. Hosted by me, Carrie Grant, each episode will feature interviews with leading voices on autism, including figures from the business world, autistic social media influencers, and autism academics alike. We'll be talking about the many benefits of hiring neurodiverse talent through to some of the more common challenges faced by autistic adults navigating the workplace. All my four children are neurodivergent, so this is a subject very close to my heart. I'm really looking forward to facilitating some great conversations about autism and hopefully learning some new things along the way. I hope you enjoy. So welcome to our first show. You're listening to the first ever Autism in Conversation with Auticon, the only podcast dedicated to talking about all things neurodiversity in the workplace. In this episode, we'll be talking to some fantastic guests about how things have changed for neurodivergent workers in recent years, as well as what changes can be made to support workers who have a diagnosis of autism. We'll also be talking about some new research by Auticon, which looks at how likely people are to disclose that they are autistic and what the implications of that can be. Finally, we'll be wrapping up by talking about what new developments are taking place in the world of work to help pave the way for more neurodivergent talent to thrive. And joining me uh, today, we've got a huge team of people. We've got Dan Jones, host of YouTube channel The Aspie World. Ella Tab, more commonly known on her social media channels as Purple Ella. Steve Hill, who's the commercial director at Auticon UK. Tim Nichols, head of policy at the National Autistic Society. And autistic speaker, consultant and social media content creator, Connor Ward. Welcome to all of you. It's great to have you with us today. Now, before we get on to the show, Connor has made a great suggestion that we ask our autistic uh, contributors here what it means to be autistic as a sort of kickstarter. So, Connor, seeing as you suggested it, let's start with you. To me, I feel it's about me having a brain that focuses on the detail and enjoys the detail, processes the detail before building out to a bigger picture. And that's opposite to a neurotypical, someone who's uh, not neurodivergent, who will look at the big picture first and work the way into the details. And it manifests in various different areas of life. I love that. I feel I, I, that's very filmic. Very good. OK, Ella. Yeah, for me, being autistic is about being extremely sensitive in a world that was not designed for people that are extremely sensitive. and. Um, a different way of looking at things, often a really passionate way of looking at things that is stands out as different amongst neurotypical people. Yes, I hear that. I hear that completely. And for you, Dan? Um, yeah, you know, for me, being autistic is, um, it's kind of like your, um, your it, how can I explain? It's like having a, your you're on display to show the world what autism looks like, right? So you have a responsibility to uh, show everybody uh, in an educational format what it looks like, you know? And I think that we all carry that kind of responsibility. So that's what it feels like to me. That's so interesting because that's something that many other communities would say that the, it, the pressure of representation can be really quite overwhelming. I hadn't even thought yeah. about that for our community here, but that, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Now, this podcast is going to mainly focus on autism in the workplace. And Auticon has recently carried out some research that shows that as many as one in 10 autistic workers don't feel they can reveal their diagnosis in the workplace. So we want to just dig into that a little bit and find out why that is. Um, let's go first to Tim from the National Autistic Society. Do those figures, do the figures surprise you? People not disclosing? Those figures don't surprise me at all. Actually, when um, a few years ago, when we did some research at the National Autistic Society, we found similar that it's a very mixed picture um, for autistic people. It was a pretty, pretty equal between those who uh, wanted to be able to disclose and had disclosed and those who didn't want to and when you consider the stakes um, are really quite high um, for disclosing your autism if you don't know that you're going to be accepted understood um, or that any changes are going to made and be made in the workplace for you you can understand that I mean 
we also heard from people that as a consequence sometimes of telling people that they're autistic that they felt like their employer's attitudes to them changed and not in a good way um we heard from people in the in the in the worst situation who were bullied then because they're autistic and actually so by doing what they felt like was the right thing that might have led to more support they had accidentally you know become target of things that then meant they had to leave their job now that's, that's so completely hard. wrong and there's obviously a, uh, there's obviously a lot of work that needs to be done to make to change attitudes around autistic people too but actually what we need to do what everyone should be working towards is creating society where everyone who's autistic feels comfortable to disclose in the workplace that they are autistic because they're confident that that's going to lead to the right support and being properly understood and respected by their colleagues. Steve, uh, just bring, bringing you in here, because in a way what we're saying to autistic people is, you know, be your proud self, be yourself, you know, show up as who you are. And that's a fantastic thing. But at the same time, we're like, well, actually, that may not be such a good thing to do. So what do people do? In your experience, are people, you, you've done this survey, one in 10 autistic workers don't feel that they can reveal their diagnosis. What's going on there? Well, I mean, I guess for, for me... It is about that overall awareness, isn't it? I mean, it's it's about trying to educate, certainly from the from, from our perspective, the, the business community at large, so that you know ultimately there is no difference. You know, a lot of the things that we see uh, and the things that we're trying to do are to basically point out the fact that there's nothing really to be scared of as an employer um, in terms of actually embracing neurodivergent talent. And so, you know, it's it's a journey, you know, and we have to handhold and we have to take people uh, on that journey. And the handholding is often with the companies, not necessarily the autistic people. It seems like the companies need a bit of handholding here. Absolutely, without doubt. Yeah, it is, you know, it is that fear and that um, that risk that people within companies just they they need help to overcome that. And that's at the moment, that's the, the kind of bridge and the, that's the, the help that we provide. It hasn't escaped me that uh, at the beginning of this podcast, just asking uh, Dan and Ella and Connor uh, what it meant to them to be autistic, um, we had sort of that, uh, Connor saying, you know, it's that mega focus that I've got that that sees the detail. We had Ella talking about the sensitivities, living in a very insensitive world. And then Dan sort of saying, you know, I've, I've then got to be on show for everybody. That's three, we've seen strengths, we've seen a challenge, and we've seen actually you're there to educate. That's a lot of pressure on autistic people Steve to, to have to do all of that right it is absolutely um, and I think you know it is only through awareness through education and and doing things like this frankly um, because there is a long way to go but actually we are seeing you know we are seeing things change it's not all doom and gloom we have to reinforce that but ultimately you do have to start somewhere let's go to uh, Connor then has has there ever been an, a time where you've thought I just can't mention that I'm autistic because that would be really bad right now. Um, yeah, actually, it, it's it's when when I'm in social situations, I think actually. So so if we actually put it in the workplace, in more social uh, it, the social etiquette around work, um, you can very quickly gauge who doesn't have awareness because awareness isn't just awareness. Awareness is awareness, understanding, acceptance. Which is that's in fact I think that's the journey that you're pretty much describing there. Um, so I like in in earlier workplaces that I I, I had had a few short jobs. Um, it, I I didn't feel comfortable in in sharing because it, you can very quickly gauge a an environment to see that everybody else is going to a level of expectation, and you can you can automatically feel you're not at that level of of expectation anyway. Um, so disclosing. For me, it, like I, I'm thinking of a particular job, it wouldn't have done anything because everyone was still expected to do the same thing anyway, and there wasn't shown uh, to be the opportunity for people to be different as such. Didn't that make you feel like you couldn't show up as yourself, though? Yeah, uh, well, just exclusion actually, so avoidance behaviour as opposed to um, you know, as opposed to pretending to be someone else. It'd just be to completely not engage. You know, I'm I'm not going going to engage with other people talking about what the weather's like in the mornings because it, it, I don't understand why we've got to perform in such a way. So it, it was more avoidance. It was running away at lunch and and trying to find somewhere by myself, etc. 
Ella, what's your experience been like in this area? Have you ever felt, obviously you talk about being autistic all the time as, as part of your job now, but, you know, has there ever been a time where you've thought, I just, I daren't mention this, it's, I just know the, the, the backlash is going to be too bad? Yeah, I mean, I, I've always been self-employed, so I've never really had an employer, but there's been times in jobs I used to work as a circus artist prior to doing what I do now, and so I would be very much working contract from contract, and there would be times in jobs where I felt like it would be useful to disclose, but I think that unfortunately we still live in a world where we very much look at disability from kind of a deficit point of view um, rather than a strength point of view, um, and also um, as autistic people we start to carry that internally and so we think oh I mustn't ask for anything it starts to feel like you're being needy if you're disclosing and you're asking for support and so I think as an individual you have to really reach a point where you're like actually I know that if I get this level of support I'm going to be able to offer offer so much value so actually I have a right and it is worth me asking for that but to be at that level of confidence when you're someone who's grown up as an autistic person who's been kind of constantly rejected takes a lot of personal development a lot of work it takes a lot of time and it's very hard so for when you to I advocate, have, very hard for you to advocate for yourself as well in those in yeah. those situations. Coming from that position, it's hard to advocate for yourself. Exactly. That's what I'm saying, really. So now I find disclosing reasonably easy because I'm confident. But previously, I probably wouldn't have said anything because I didn't want to come across as needy or difficult or anything that might make me less employable, I guess. Yeah. That's that's very sad to hear. And and for for you, Dan, has there ever been a point where you've thought, I better not say anything? Yeah, I think you know, different to to what the other um, people have said. I think you know, the only times where I felt maybe I, I don't want to disclose it is when you don't fully trust the people who you're working with or the people you're around. Because at the end of the day, advantage can be taken. Um, you know, because you are in a vulnerable position uh, in social situations, especially in working environments when something, if somebody's, if somebody's attentions are not, you know, right, they may trick you into doing something or working longer hours or, do, you know what I mean? Because you think that's what's supposed to happen if if, they, if you disclose that they, they're, if you disclose that you're autistic, then you're saying, hey, look, I'm potentially vulnerable in certain situations. And it takes, it takes a lot of confidence to say that. And you have to be confident around the people who you are working with and disclosing that with. So I've had situations where I don't want to disclose that because I don't want them to find that as a, as a hole to kind of use as a, or a loophole for taking advantage, you know. Tim, it seems to me, just hearing our contributors there, that this, there's a, a need to somehow help autistic people to feel like they can be more confident. It's not just about being it, but that they're allowed allowed to be and they have to be. But equally, isn't it about the, the workplace coming towards our autistic community and actually making inroads so that that, that, that journey is a bit easier for them? Yeah, absolutely. This isn't about autistic people changing who they are or how they behave. This is about society and employers changing so that they exactly. understand better and they are more accepting. And, you know, ultimately, that's that the National Autistic Society. That's our mission, creating a society that works for autistic people to be autistic people. Um, I think there are lots of things that can help along the way of, of doing that. And I think part of that is employers understanding and also uh, things like government employment support programs, understanding that actually training and understanding um, are really good reasonable adjustments. They're, they're, they're things that are prerequisites to often to autistic people um, thriving in the workplace uh, and they should absolutely be done and be a core part of support. It's not just about an autistic person figuring out what works for them uh, and how they might behave differently in in an office or how they might fit in it's about making sure that the office around them fits too um and so kind of things need to shift we need to turn that on its head a little bit so it's not always just about an autistic person fitting in because actually that could lead to lots of the things that we talked about today or autistic people masking the fact that they're finding things difficult and while they may be delivering at work it could be taking a real toll um and then what's the point of work if it's not fulfilling yeah, I hear you on that. Steve, what, what's your experience at Auticon with, with this kind of thing? Is, are you making it easier for people? To, you know, you're clearly in that middle ground, aren't you? Introducing our autistic community into the workplace and introducing the workplace towards autistic people. So what, what, what piece of work are you guys doing to really make that happen? So, so it is really about education. I mean, as Tim says, it is making... You know the the organisation and the environment within that organisation accepting, and it starts with education 
frankly. Um, and again, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to this many times, but these are things that actually are beneficial to everyone, not just, you know, autistic people. Um, and I think that's the message. And actually by doing that education and actually spending time with those organisations, it is about that fear and risk mitigation, ultimately. Can you guys talk me through then best practice when you've gone into a situation and you've thought that really, really worked for me? What does good look like? Let's go to Connor first. Good for me looks like flexibility. It's it's people being open minded. It's people being accepting and letting go of traditional values, because that is that is a lot of the things that do disable autistic people. Um, it's the fact that people have an idea as to what being autistic is, or maybe that's a really outdated idea. Uh, so good for me is uh, person-centred. How can you communicate with a person to get the best out of them? You know, nobody can describe a person's needs better than themselves. So not not just talking about good, being perfect is to listen to the person. Is it certain, though, that you always know what it is that you need? I know sometimes in my children, they're not even, or I don't know as a parent, I'm like, I kind of know they need help, but I'm not, I don't, unless someone gave me some ideas, I wouldn't really know how to verbalise that. Yeah, well, th this is another problem, the fact that we're not even taught about ourselves from a young age. Yeah. You know, like, I, I think about how long it took for us to all understand sensory systems and how, because that's a massive part in, into being autistic, understanding and, and being on top of your sensory system, yet we're just not taught it from a young age um, to the level of detail that, that it is required. Um, so, yeah, as soon as we get the education right amongst everyone, then that's when that will work. Um, but so, so allowing people to explore themselves and to uh, and then be able to explain their own needs, then that's always going to be the best. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Connor. Ella, for you, what would you say was a really good, you know, something, a story that you, you've encountered that you've got? Yeah, that really worked. I'm so pleased those people understood me, got me and I felt I could, could speak my truth and be myself. Yeah, I think I would echo what um, Connor said about the types of people that come in with a curiosity for who you are and what your needs might be, as opposed to coming in with a, I know what autism is, you'll want a routine kind of an attitude. Yeah. But I think that the best um, approaches to supporting me have been kind of strength based, you know, like we know that you're capable of this. How, what can we put in place to make you best placed to be able to deliver this? Um, and what does that look like? I think. I love that. So str looking at your strengths and also I love this concept of just being, people being curious. We always say, you know, I would rather face, certainly in the education system when I'm, you know, helping my children, I would rather have someone say to me, I've got no idea about autism, could you help me? Than I would some teacher say, oh, I've, I think I'm, you know, I've, I've been working with autism for years and you're like, oh gosh, no, this is going to be a nightmare. <laughs> this is what yeah, I know that so well. Yeah, as a parent, I also have two autistic children I that that teacher that goes I've worked with 10 autistic children I know exactly what I'm doing is just much worse than someone with no experience as you've said who says teach me about your child yeah we, we find yeah. so often uh, I encounter so many people like this that claim to know everything about autism but don't know the first thing about autistic people and there's yes. a massive difference there yes 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 I'm hearing you yeah and the indiv and the individuality of it too Dan best best experiences where you've just gone yeah that works yeah, um, you know, I, I travel a lot because of my work um, and I fly a lot. And one of the best experiences I've had with people um, when, that, when, you know, uh, telling me you're autistic is um, I was flying to Cardiff. Um, I was doing some stuff for the BBC and, um, and I, I, oh, I missed my flight back. Ugh. But what happened is uh, the Cardiff airport, they'd all been trained with the, like, they have a special like autism kind of like section. And so I went over to the guys and said, oh, you know, I've like, missed my flight. And I'm like, I was like freaking out. And then I said, like, I'm sorry. And like, I'm on the spectrum. Like, and then they were really cool about it. And, and they, they were just, uh, the experience that I had with them is that they were just completely non judgmental. They were like, oh, cool. Okay, come here, sit down. They were really accommodating. I think that's the word I should use. They were accommodating. They said, look, have a sit down. We'll get some water. Is anything we do for you? Like, they couldn't do enough to help, you know. And with that, it kind of like got rid of all of the, I have to explain why. I'm I'm not having a good time, you know, and so and that pressure of trying to explain to somebody why you're having a difficult time whilst you're having a difficult time, yes, um, it can lead to more issues, and so um and so that was probably one of the best the, because they were trained in it, you know, so they they'd had the, they'd had a background training and 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 what what the key element there was that they were they weren't opinionated 
um, and they were just trying to accommodate the best they could, you know. And I think that was, you know, that's true, like humanitarianism, really. And that's where we all should be, regardless of being autism. It should be everybody. You don't know what people are going through. You don't know what people's abilities are. So you should always look to that kind of uh, concept. I, I hear you on that, Dan. I know my, my kids always say, you know, I shouldn't have to go into the world and give a reason for my existence. Google is free. <laughs> Whose job is it, Tim, to educate people? Well, ultimately, I think it's a little bit of everyone's um, because, again, I hate to say it again, but we're, we're talking about transforming society here. But uh, when we're looking particularly at the workplace, let's let's break it down a bit. So I think there's a big role here for government. Um, the Equality Act exists. It's there to make sure that there are legal duties to, to make reasonable adjustments. But there's a gap between people's knowledge of knowing they're supposed to do that and what that reasonable adjustment could look like. So I think there's a really important role for government to provide the information for employers um, so that they know they can be some hints and tips about what some of those reasonable adjustments might be so they can suggest to people some of them and say would any of these work but most importantly impress upon employers that they should be having that conversation with the autistic person to to figure it out uh, between them so that it's properly person-centered just like you know connor and ella have been saying it's one of the things that actually as part of we ha- we run a program called autism in work where we not only work with the employers we also work with the autistic people to do some of the matching advertise up opportunities and then provide some coaching so that people can find that that common ground between them of what the reasonable adjustments are that would work and i think that kind of approach can 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 really work and then there's really important things like yes uh carrie exactly as you were saying the national autistic society's website autism.org.uk there's tons of information on there there's even a free module for autistic seekers on there um those things can be really helpful but you know our reach is only um so far and it's really important that people know that those resources are out there and loads of other resources too um to make sure that it's really getting across and then obviously we're on this call with three mega influencers who all play their role as well in making sure that people know more about autism and i think the more of that the better um because we've seen a huge shift in awareness uh over the last uh 30, 40 years. Um, so I think back to when I was a kid and we were explaining that my older brother is autistic, no one had a clue what we were talking about. I think at least if we said that now, we'd start from a higher base. But we've got to move from awareness to understanding and acceptance. And that's the journey that's still to come. Steve, Tim has just spoken about the government and, and the sort of the legislation that's out there to, to, that's meant to help to open the doors for all diversity and inclusion, but still... People like you need to exist. Companies like Autocon need to exist. In a way, sadly, yes. I mean, we're sort of 10 years old. We were founded, um, you know, we were founded in Germany. But fundamentally, it was through lived experience. You know, our original founder had an autistic child and was just dismayed at the, you know, the employment opportunities. And so, you know, the business was born. So ultimately, there shouldn't be a need for us. But actually, in terms of, you know, the practical application of rolling up sleeves to, to be out there. Now, we can't do everything and, and, and nor should we, but it is about trying to educate and, and going through that journey of awareness, uh, as Connor mentioned. Absolutely. Now, I want to just allude to something that you mentioned to me in a, in a prior conversation I've had with you that I was really shocked about, because we know that uh, employment for autistic people is, is not great. But you said at Autocon you can't get enough autistic people signing up. That's right. I mean, you did say that, didn't you? I did. No, absolutely. He actually said that, guys. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> we are a social enterprise, which yeah. which is great. You know, we're not a charity, um, and we're not a full commercial business in in the true sense of the word. But ultimately, that means that we can reinvest in our business, and the cornerstone of our social mission really is to provide long term career opportunities to autistic people. I guess, you know, we've all got a job to do to try and make us a little bit more, you know, well well known. But ultimately, our biggest challenge is trying to reach those people 
that we could potentially have the conversation with about, you know, how to expedite or to start a career in in IT. And let's not forget that there's a real commercial benefit to, you know, businesses at large because the areas that we tend to focus on is things like cybersecurity and everything around data, which is just exploding. There's a huge, huge demand globally. I mean, you know, Silicon Valley was effectively built, um, you know, on, for the most part, people with, with autism. And so for that reason, we see our, you know, our contribution really to, to try and just do as much as we can. We're in eight countries, you know, we've grown consistently over the last 10 years, but we've got a long way to go. And it, it really is about trying to just tell everyone that we're here and we can help. And, and working with, you know, Tim and, and you know, the, the folks on this on this episode is just that next step closer to being able to do that. So in 10 years, you've gone from starting in Germany, you spread out to eight countries, is what you're saying? Eight countries, obviously across Europe, we're in Australia, North America, Canada. So, and what kind of companies, you've mentioned IT there, is it only IT? Well, so the service that we provide is IT related. So yes, we work with IT companies, but actually, you know, we don't discriminate by size or industry. Uh, We're very prevalent in uh, professional services, legal, financial services, particularly in banking. Um, But I guess our goal, ultimately, if we were to project ourselves sort of forward five, 10, maybe 15 years is to look at totally different industries as well. So the media and arts. arts. Exactly. Yes. So many autistic people are creative. I meet so many, you know, amazing singer, dancer, actor, writers, you know, the out of the box thinkers make the most incredible art. And we need, we need to be harnessing that. But again, our industry is not always so great at providing what's necessary to create the environment where autistic people can thrive. So Auticon work on both sides of the coin, don't they? Bringing those two things together. So on, on a normal everyday day for you, what would it look like? So, I mean, largely we spend an awful lot of time with clients. And so, again, at various points in... Now, who's the client? Just so the, clarif- the, the, clarify the autistic person is the client or the well, so, company uh, is the client? The company. So from that perspective, you know, we do we do kind of three main things. So we, we raise that awareness. So we do that training. Um, and then we talk about how we can help that company to, to really embrace that, you know, that 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 lived experience within the, that project team so it's not it's not good enough to just be educated you've got to roll your sleeves up and, and get stuck into it and so from there it's really about helping that organization to become self-sufficient ultimately so how can organizations you know attract retain and develop you know neurodiverse talent for themselves because you know we, we can't do it all nor should we but it's it's getting that to that point of self-sufficiency really now our neurodivergent talent here have all chosen eventually or it started or ended up running their own businesses so there's a slight disconnect, even I'm thinking, as we put this podcast out, here we're talking about making more space for autistic people in the workplace, and yet our three guests have found the doors are closed. They've had to start their own business. Perhaps they would have always started their own business, but there is a, a large percentage of our autism community who, who do end up being self-employed. Connor, what do you think would make the difference for autistic people, do you think it's always going to be that way that autistic people are better off working for themselves? Or do you think there is going to be an opportunity where they can cross collaborate? Well, I'm self-employed mostly because it means I'm in control of, of my workload. I'm, I, I'm not only myself as in on, on a professional working front, I'm also my own manager. You know, I have to manage myself. I have to go, you can't do this tomorrow because you've done this and this is going to exhaust you. Um, so that's what it appeals to me on, on my side. But I've also, like, I am self-employed, but I do get to work with companies and I get to work with staff with, with you know, to be in a hierarchy. And you can have people who can look after you and, and help you uh, to help to have the same kind of conversations. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's non-existent. I don't think it's completely there. One thing I do find is that it's normally people who seek training or to seek education are never normally the people that need it. Um, so 
because it's, so it, it, it's mostly about, you know, because that, that's the initial hurdle of attitude because they, they've obviously got the right attitude. Every single person needs to have the training and understanding uh, in a professional environment to be able to understand their workforce. And until that happens, I don't think it is going to be as seamless as of, oh, I could be self-employed or I could work for a company. Mm. So actually some of the really hard to reach people are the companies. Well, yeah, especially the higher up you get on these yeah, on these hierarchies. I'm that's where you, get, you, where you start to get that happening. I'm hearing you. How, how about f- for you, Ella? I think um, for me, it's about, uh, particularly as a female presenting person, kind of getting a foot in the door in the first place was an issue for me. Like a lot of getting work and getting into a business is about the interview or it's about people that you know or it's about people warming to you and liking you the minute you walk through the door. And sad to say, that doesn't seem to be a quality that I possess. So I've ended up being self-employed because I like me. Um, so <laughs> we love you. Until we have... <laughs> until we all we like you. Kind of, oh, thank you. Until we have kind of systemic change about how we approach people with less judgment and with more compassion this is always going to be an issue the kind of uh, old boys club but you know expanded so I think that this change that we're talking about in workplaces needs to happen as part of the interview process before we've even started employing people to be honest wow I'm really hearing that I'm really that that's a great great comments there Dan you know um it's really funny you know to really strip it down so the reasons why why am I self-employed versus why, you know, there's a hundred reasons, you know, that go, go for this. Like, you know, why, why would a not, why would a not this person be more favorable to be self-employed than to be employed by somebody, right? There's a hundred million reasons, but, but they're all going to be like, um, uh, subjected to the person, you know, it's down to the person. But for me, and I'll tell you this, because I can be as creative as I want. I mean, the only, literally the only limit is the sky when it comes to my work. And I love being creative. I wake up literally three o'clock in the morning, like writing stuff down. Um, I, like I said, I start working about five, six o'clock in the morning. I'm constantly doing so. I'm working right now while doing this podcast and doing stuff as well. I just love creating things. And when you're working for an employer, you're, you're restricted and capped to their levels of creativity, which is sometimes so mundane of that of the Monday, like you don't even get to express yourself, you know? I get so frustrated because I always have to, I want to learn new things and try new things. Like I'm building NFTs right now, and you know, we're playing with different types of like virtual reality software and I just want to do more, you know, always. And I think traditional employment doesn't cater for expansion of, of, of I don't know, creativity, but, but being self-employed does that. And I think that's the key. But if an employer could really harness a, 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 a student of work or a colleague or, or an employee's uh, level of creativity, they could really like 10x the company. And I think that's really the key there. I want to end with Tim. We, we, we've got so many heads nodding around this uh, little <laughs> podcast table like, yes, 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 absolutely done. I mean, Tim, what is not to like? In, with these guys, you just be like, just employ this person right now. Give them a job. Open the doors. You know, even if they're self-employed, you just want to open doors for these guys. There's so much talent sitting right here. Well, absolutely. And, you know, this, these guys are just a kind of a, a, a microcosm of the, of the untapped pool of autistic talent that is out there. Just to go back briefly to that conversation about self-employment, I think it's fantastic how these they've, they've all um, really – lent into the positives of self-employment and that will be true for a lot of autistic people my my kind of my reflection on it would be like wouldn't it be great if every autistic person who is self-employed were self-employed by choice because we know that some autistic people end up there by default because the work like the employed workforce hasn't worked and some people will want the security and the routine that, 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 that an employed job might bring so there's there's obviously still work to do there but yeah if we can really enhance what autistic people can make for themselves from self-employment would be fantastic but absolutely if there's say for all those employers who are out there listening for those who've already started along the journey and we know there are some who do particularly look for neurodivergent employees because they want people who think a bit differently it feels really positive to be able to kind of go like yeah there's there's so many autistic people out there who could really bring something to your workplace you need to think a bit differently you need to create a workplace that thinks a little bit differently but you're all going to reap the benefits from it well i was going to give you the last word but i can see connor sitting next to me with itchy feet (laughs) so i've done a lot of work with the national autistic society and i've got to say that that is my like absolute example 
my reasonable adjustments, my personal needs, don't feel like reasonable adjustments when, whenever I've done work with the National Autistic Society. It's just my needs. And that's, that's a difference. Um, and that's what I think every employer needs to get to the point at where every single employee doesn't feel different because of their, their needs. Everybody has needs, and it's as simple as that. And not to hijack the last word, but that's absolutely <laughs> right because I think everyone wants two things. You know, we all want to be accepted for who we are and we all want to be appreciated for the work that we do. And we all want to be able to... I'm just trying to get the last word in. Oh, I am <laughs> Well, I've got the last word. Thanks, everybody. It's been great having you with me today. Steve Hill, Tim Nichols, Dan Jones, Ella Tab and Connor Ward. Thank you so much to my guests. We have learned so much. We'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much for listening. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism in conversation with Auticon. Just to mention, in terms of a community preference language, all episodes in this series were recorded in November 2021. We did our recording and production at the Strathmore Studios in Clerkenwell, London. It was engineered and edited by Billy Godfrey. Music was by The Lethargies. If you'd like to know more about the next show or would like further information about how Auticon can help, please visit www.auticon.co.uk. That's all from us this time. Bye for now.